Okay, so we have a great showing today for our session on instructional approaches to hybrid courses. Welcome, we are excited to have you here. We have a lot to um, go over and do today, so let's just jump right in. My name is Stephanie Rodick, and I am the Manager of Professional Learning here in the Office of Distance Education and eLearning. And Queenie is joining me from OD. Um, do you wanna talk, Queenie, a little bit about who you are and your role today? Yes, I'm a consultant at OD, and um, today I'll mainly just be in the chat here, uh, providing links and resources throughout the session. The presenters will pause periodically throughout the session to answer questions that you type in there for us. Uh, we'll get to as much as we can. Um, and just to make sure you don't feel too overwhelmed, you don't have to open the chat if you want to focus on the presentation and not follow every single thing that's going on in the chat, that's totally okay. I just post resources there as a supplemental reading material in case you want to learn even more about each of these topics as we talk about them. Thanks, Queenie. Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa Johnson. And for starters, I'll go ahead and post oh. the link to the slides as well as a couple other things in there for you. She's delayed, Teresa. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Teresa. <laughs> figured it out. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Teresa Johnson, and I am the high impact uh, curriculum expert for the Office of Academic Enrichment. So I am very thankful for um, Teresa and Queenie's help today. We um, have about 90 minutes today to hopefully help you meet um, five different outcomes. So um, today we are hoping that by the end, you'll be able to define kind of the different ways that you can structure a hybrid course. We hope that you'll be able to identify the opportunities and challenges of hybrid uh, courses and designing and teaching them. We hope that you'll be able to make some decisions on how to implement particular strategies. And then we hope that you'll be able to consider ways to incorporate student engagement um, and different ways of delivering content. And then obviously, if, for all of our sessions, we hope that you'll know where are the resources, how can you continue to get help? So <clears throat> based on those outcomes, our agenda looks pretty similar to that. And uh, Teresa and I will be taking turns uh, back and forth. And as Queenie mentioned, she will be um, answering questions in the chat. We also have a couple other people from OD who are um, here today who <clears throat> some of them are just watching and being a participant like you and others, uh, are here, hopefully um, all of them actually will help with the chat. There's a lot of you here today, which is fantastic, but it's also really challenging to get all your questions answered. So if it's um, if you start seeing other folks from ODI answering questions, that's why. <laughs> and I really much, very much appreciate their help today. <clears throat> so why don't we get started? And we're gonna get started with a, uh, a chat, um, a poll questioning. <clears throat> and we are interested in finding out what your experience with hybrid courses is. So let me put up a poll here. <clears throat> all right, you should all be seeing a, a poll up there. What is your experience with hybrid courses? And this is multiple choice. So select all that apply. And I'll give you a little bit of time here. All right, we're just over 50%. Oh, you guys are so good this morning. You're all on top of this. We're almost at 90%. Interesting. So it looks like the winner is uh, the folks that are going to be teaching a hybrid course in the future. That's good. And those who have never taught a hybrid course before or are considering. Yeah, we, so our six people who have taken a course as a student, please feel free to add your perspective <laughs> from the other side. All right, we have a nice range. So I think this will be a good conversation. 
All right, so the next thing that we uh, want to do is to give you a chance to get into small groups since it's gonna be hard to talk with this many people. Um, we're gonna give you a chance to, for about five minutes to get into a small group and briefly share answers, your answers to the following questions. Um, we wanna think positively about hybrid courses. So what do we think that we can, that you can gain from, um, or your students can gain from teaching a hybrid course uh, using that method, um, that pedagogy? And um, what have you learned from any experiences that you have had with hybrid courses? So those two questions. So uh, Stephanie is gonna get us into small groups and we'll give you about five minutes to discuss those two questions. So what I would like for us to do is um, if you would like to uh, share something that came up in your group, just in chat, um, I'm interested in, in uh, seeing what you all came up with. And we apologize again for the, um, the experience with the breakout rooms. We had some people coming in and, this, and as people come in to the session, um, it, it does weird things to the breakout room process. So Stephanie was, was battling folks moving in two directions. So we apologize for the, uh, the Star Wars experience there. Yes, we are happy to put the questions in the chat box. Jane, uh, Queenie, can you um, help us remember to do that so that they have them when they we get We have to one it. at the end, so. All right, let's see. What are we seeing come in here? So being able to provide instruction outside of just more screen time. You can chat, you can put your answers in the chat. That's how we'd like to do that. With so many people, we can't come off of mute. So being able to um, being able to have students watch certain lectures again, but then also being able to be in person and have fewer videos possibly. All right, so um, yeah, being able to watch videos on their own time. All right, so. Thank you for those, and we will we will get back to more of um, of those benefits of um, hybrid soon. So Stephanie's going to take us through some different definitions of some different modalities, so that we're all talking about the same thing here today. I'm chuckling at Janet's comments. <laughs> oh. It's a new allergy. Maybe Pfizer will come up with something. <laughs> okay. So let's quickly go through some of the types of modalities. And I'm doing this as a way to start and making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what are the, the terms that we use to describe not just teaching in the hybrid course, but in lots of other things. So this is just a list of the, the ones that we'll go through today. And one thing you will find if you start to dig into the literature is that people start to define things starting with hybrid down all different ways. So I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page today. And I'll give you the way that the university and uh, Teresa and I think about these particular kinds of modalities. So this first one, hopefully no one disagrees. <laughs> so we've got our standard in-person course, right? And we have lots of different, um, Slightly very slight variations, I should say, right? So it's not all 100% in person. It can also include, right, a, quite a bit of work online. That may be that they're taking exams online, right, or they are getting their readings online. Um, but generally speaking, this is our normal kind of in-person class that we have. There is a very consistent schedule, though. The students know that their classes are Tuesday and Thursday for 80 minutes. And so their schedule may look something like this, right? For a Monday, Wednesday class, they know they're coming onto campus, they're coming into a building on Monday and Wednesday, and they've got homework and other things that they have to do on the other days. The other one I think we all can agree on is the distance courses, and that is 100% online. There are no in-person options for a distance course, right? So everything happens 
um, online. They don't have anything required to come to in person. And there isn't necessarily a specific set or formalized uh, schedule for when um, things happen for the course, right? I mean, obviously you have due dates, right? And there's a structure, but it's not like they know that they need to log on and do this one thing at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday with an exception. So most of the time we have um, an example that looks like this for the students who are in our online programs. They know that every day they're gonna have something that they have to probably do on Carmen, some reading, some activities, some assessment with other things that they'll need to do for homework. Or sometimes our students do have um, some kind of Zoom experience. And in particular, during a pandemic, that's really helpful, right, to keep some kind of connection. But some of our online courses do have a synchronous component, right, where they're all meeting up online. It could actually be, um, you know, for um, office hours, even, maybe not an actual lecture. And then we start to get into modalities that maybe not everyone knows very well. So then we have at Ohio State a distance enhanced course and other universities call it something slightly different, right? But a distance enhanced course means that it's mostly, right, uh, online. And there's a portion of the course that's happening on campus anywhere from you know, a teeny tiny bit to just under a quarter. And when that happens, it's usually for things like come and take this exam, right, in person, or let's meet in the beginning and of, of the course and get to know each other in person and maybe we'll meet in person, you know, one or two more times. Or maybe there's kind of complex activity that um, is better in person and they have to do that once. Or maybe there's a guest lecture that they need to attend. But generally speaking, it's mostly online with a few opportunities. It's still not consistent though. It doesn't mean that they're coming to campus right every Tuesday. It's still all online. And then there's just a few other opportunities. And then there's what we're talking about today, which is hybrid courses. So you can see at Ohio State, we have particular percentages between 25 and 74% of each. But generally speaking, what you'll see in the literature and what other universities do is it's generally somewhere around half, right? That's like the easiest way to think about it. It could be a little bit skewed one way or the other, but there are almost kind of equal parts. So there's both the online and there's the in-person. And the way that we want to think about these courses, and we'll say this numerous times today, is that what's happening um, in our online portion is that we're taking some part of an in-person course and we're replacing it, right, by doing something online. We're not adding an online component. We're just taking things. If we think about taking an in-person course and making it hybrid, we're taking pieces of an online course and we're putting it online. And we're going to talk today about whether or not those things become assessments, there are exams and assignments, or maybe those things are content, and maybe those things are activities and a combination of all of those. But this happens on a consistent basis. The schedule is constant for students, and that's a really important piece to understand that this is that they know, for example, that on Monday in their schedule, they are coming to class and they are meeting face to face with all of the other students in their course, and the rest of the time they're doing things on Carmen. Sometimes we may end up having a hybrid course where there is an on-campus um, on component and rather than doing everything on Carmen, for example, maybe there's um, a replacement so that all of our students are doing something synchronous in Zoom. I would say the majority of, kind of the traditional hybrid courses though is this example, right, that everything else is asynchronous. But you do have hybrid courses where there's a synchronous component for the whole class. So let me stop for a second and just kind of give a, some broad overviews of what it means to be in a hybrid course. And I know we have uh, six or so of you who said that you've taken hybrid courses as a student. So I'm curious to see where your experience uh, falls into this. So I think it's important to think about a hybrid course as kind of this pedagogical shift, right? And a pedagogical shift from what is normally done in a, a fully on campus in-person course. And why I say pedagogical shift is we need to think differently about what the role of the students and the instructors are, and <laughs> which um, may fly in the face of what Janet was talking about and others were agreeing with, you know, the students really struggling um, 
with maybe doing the reading, for example. But in a hybrid course, what we need to um, consider is that students really do need to take more responsibility for their learning process. It is much more um, of an independent experience, very similar to online students. So students who take online courses uh, in pre-pandemic times when they're taking truly online courses that were designed to be that as part of online programs, they know what they're getting themselves into, right? They understand those students that they have to be self-motivated, that they have to work independently, that they really do have to be very self-directed. That's the nature of it. In a hybrid course, you still have those, those pieces, right? There are still things that students are gonna have to do on their own. What that means on the flip side is that instructors end up spending less time with them, not just face-to-face, -face, but less time lecturing and much more time interacting and guiding students, particularly on that online part of a hybrid course. And one of the things that will also come up a few times is this idea that the online and the in-person components of a course are complementary. They feed into each other. They work together as one. It is not, a hybrid class is not, the in-class part, and I'm just gonna shove them over in Carmen for a while and have them do right, some things on there. I'll have them take a quiz and I'll have them read. Really there are activities, content, and assignments that feed into each other. And Teresa will give a, um, an example here in a little bit, but what that could look like. So let's get back to these modalities for a second. So here are some other words that have been thrown around, particularly thanks to COVID-19. Um, one of them is a blended course. And there is a lot of contradiction out there in the literature and at different universities about how we talk about blended. Um, one of the, the books that I used um, to get some ideas for examples and ways to talk about hybrid courses for this particular workshop was a course that's um, a, a book that is done by Katie Linder, who actually, Teresa, she worked for Teresa and I for many years as a grad student. I mean, she wrote a book on blended learning. And she talks about blended learning as actually the same thing as hybrid, right, as hybrid classes. But there are others that will like, be very nitpicky about that blended is actually different than hybrid. In this case, we're just going to say that blended and hybrid are virtually the same thing, right? That it's mostly... Um, a combination of that online and in-person. To some folks will define it as that blended is mostly in-person with a little bit of technology. But for today's purposes, if I accidentally say blended, right, I mean hybrid in the way that we've defined it already. Then there's high flex courses. This has also come up a lot since the pandemic, <laughs> understandably. And so there is also some contradiction in the definitions out there. But generally what high flex means is that students have a choice in uh, the mode of attendance. So they could, for example, come to class or maybe they want to watch a, you know, some pre-recorded lecture that's online. But it also means that there's flexibility in due dates and may even be flexibility in assignments. So the emphasis there is on the flex part, it's the flexibility. So it means that students have choice. So we almost set, up a course that has like a menu of options and students pick what makes the most sense for them, right? But they're all of those pieces all feed into the same learning outcomes, right? They have to do the same kinds of activities. They may just do them in a different modality or they may do it on a different schedule. That is not necessarily how I've heard people talking about it nowadays, um, but uh, that's how we're gonna talk about it today. And then lastly, there's simulcasting. So simulcasting may be something that you guys have been doing. I'm kind of curious to know if any of you have been um, attempting to live stream your in-person class for students who are taking you know, it online. So they may be quarantined, they may be ill, um, they may have just chosen to um, just live stream in. And, and yeah, so Lexine's been doing some simulcasting. And for some folks we've been hearing, it's working fine. And other people were saying it's really hard. And part of why it's really difficult is because it is a very specific pedagogy. It is a very specific teaching strategy that needs a lot of technology and a lot of resources. So some of you do work in departments that I know have um, simulcast rooms set up. I've been in many of them where there's right, microphones all around right, the periphery. So students online and in the class can hear each other. While we 
have been hearing a lot of people talk about simulcasting as a hybrid course. That is not the kind of course we're gonna talk about today. That's kind of an exception. Um, I know some of you are doing it. I do think you'll get some good principles and ideas out of today's session, but we are not going to kind of talk too much about the simulcast aspect today. It is very challenging, as Maggie says. It, it's not easy, um, and it's just because that's not what we're set up to do. Hopefully, uh, what you can do, though, and I see Sam is in our session today, um, and maybe, Queenie, if you haven't already, if you could post the um, link to the Keep Teaching Get Help page. There is a list of workshops there, and one of them is a session that um, Sam Craighead and Andy Vogel are doing. I'm going to guess, Queenie, you will be there as well. <laughs> and that session is happening um, in January, and it will really help you think through how do I actually teach that kind of course, this kind of hybrid or in-person course, using the kinds of spaces that we have here at Ohio State. Um, and that's one aspect of it. There are other pieces to it. But in particular, if you're interested in like, how do I make this thing happen? Like, what's the equipment in this room? How do, what are some of the strategies I need to employ? That's the session that you should go to. All right. So we have just like 30 seconds or so to see, are there questions, Queenie, that have come up in the chat about just generally the course modality definitions? I have not seen any come up yet, but let's give people okay. a little moment to type. Thank you, Sam, for, that's the title. I couldn't remember the title. <laughs> Supporting physical and virtual environments and hybrid and in class. It's a, it's a, it's a mouthful, but accurate. <laughs> it's an accurate title. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question about the flipped classroom. So it does feel a little bit like a flipped kind of situation. Um, and I can see that there's, there is a parallel to the hybrid where maybe you have students do some of the material, they read the material, they may do some practice things um, online and then they come to class and then they do some activities together or discussion, right? That's kind of a flipped classroom. But a flipped classroom doesn't have to be hybrid, right? So a flipped classroom can be that the stuff you have them do online is already, you're just flipping when the homework happens, right? So rather than have them do problem sets, or do the case study during the uh, during the homework on their own, there you're flipping it so that they're doing the problem sets with you, but they're doing the reading beforehand. So it's not necessarily a, a hybrid, um, it's not necessarily a hybrid class, but there are, are aspects that feel similar to it. And we'll get into very quickly here, Teresa's gonna get into like thinking about how to make decisions about when you do different parts of the course. So you will see some of that aspect, but a flipped classroom is not a hybrid course. Okay, so um, if there are other questions that, that come up, we will, we will try to get to those later. Um, but what, what I'm interested in having you do now is tell me in chat, now that we've sort of very carefully specified what we mean by hybrid courses, what do you think the benefits of hybrid courses would be for both students and instructors? Let's, let's uh, dump some quick ideas in the chat and see what you come up with there. The reach, I'm assuming maybe that that means um, a flexibility perhaps, learning at their own pace, accessibility and equity when designed carefully, absolutely. It's the carefully part that's important there. Uh, a shorter commute. <laughs> I've been really enjoying that working from home, honestly. <laughs> I've gotten two hours of my life back every day. Uh, pacing, jammies, jammies, jammies are lovely. We like jammies. We're all about the jammies. All right. Okay, so you've got some good things in there. I want to go back and read more of those, but I want, in the interest of time and getting through everything, I want to move on to what some of uh, Stephanie's in my list were. Um, and some of these you were, I see that you were putting in there also. Um, so convenience, jammies fit in there. Um, flexibility. So it provides a, a really nice variety of um, ways to interact with your students um, and uh, 
it doesn't require you to all be in the same physical space all the time, um, as many times during the week. Um, we also think it's important that it um, allows a very different way to engage with material and probably more time for really thinking about that material, um, more time to think about and, and um, put a structure together that you can then interact with each other about um, because it's not all together speaking at the moment all the time. Um, it also can provide, uh, and maybe this is counterintuitive, but there, there are really good ways to provide more student-student interaction um, and more student-teacher interactions and connections. And this has been shown in research both outside of Ohio State and here that um, you really can get more very solid interactions that way. Um, and we also see in the research that we generally, in a well-designed course that is hybrid, get increased motivation and greater learning. So there are some really solid research-based um, benefits to this type of teaching. Um, and not surprisingly, um, the reason that you can get that really great um, increased learning, increased motivation, some of these really nice benefits is because you can take the best of what in-person classes are good for and what online courses are good for. And if you plan it carefully and bring the best of both of those worlds together, you're going to get a really nice synergistic effect here where you can take the best of both of those worlds and um, put them together into one course and uh, provide a really great learning um, environment that way. So, um, the important part about making that actually happen is that you think about um, not just sort of smashing two things together, but that you carefully interweave um, those complementary components of those two types of teaching online and in person. So um, we're going to spend a good bit of time today talking about how one goes through a design process, really ways of thinking to make sure that you can do that. So an example of what that might look like, this is just one example of many possibilities. So perhaps the first thing is that you have your students read some material or watch a brief video. And they do that before they are in class together in person. And then when they come together, um, you as the instructor can facilitate a discussion about that online material that they've already read. And then perhaps after you've been together and you've really discussed this, then students can do some sort of um, a writing assignment or a reflection or some sort of, this is what I've learned based on the class discussion that we just had. And that can happen online. Um, and then the last thing here would be that perhaps the students post that assignment. So they show their thinking to their peers and the peers can respond to each other then about each, each one's reaction to that. So you can see that it's, a, it's very tightly woven together and in a very particular order. So it's the thinking is very intentional there. In order to do that, there are some challenges that we have to really think about. We have to think about the fact that a hybrid course really requires some very careful time management skills on both parts of the instructor and for the students. So we have to very carefully plan out when things need to happen and things need to actually get accomplished during those times or the rest of the plan sort of um, becomes a jumble if we don't do that. Um, it also means that we need to be prepared to use a variety of technology tools and we need to be prepared to use ones that work best in that situation. Um, and so that means that we all need to be open to learning some things that maybe we didn't know how to do before. And we have to think about how we teach those things to our students because they aren't necessarily going to come with that ability to do that already. It also means we have to be very clear with our communication about where things are happening, when they're happening, and consistently about how those things are going to, to occur so that students are in the right place at the right time, because there's a lot of different places that we're interacting. Um, it also means that we need to be very clear about our expectations and the format about how this is going to happen. We just all need to know exactly what, what this is going to look like, both the instructor and the, the students in this case. Okay, so having said all of that, I want you to take 30 seconds to a minute. We're just gonna give you a little bit of quiet space to reflect on your own, write some things down. Um, which, which of those considerations that we just went through do you think that's going to be a, a real challenge either for yourself or for your students as you look to possibly teaching in a hybrid situation? So just take a moment and think about that.
Okay, let's come back and keep moving forward. We'll, we will do those sort of short reflections here throughout some of this design thinking um, about this. All right, so there are three um, major aspects that we want you to really think about as you think about how would I design a hybrid course. The first one of these is that we um, implore you to not uh, just add online components to an in-person course because you've got a very full in-person course already. If you're thinking about making this hybrid, there really isn't space to just add things on. So what we really want to think about is how do we replace or turn something that you do in person into something that you do online. So that's, we would consider that a replacement, not an addition. So you don't want to just say, oh, I could do all of these new things online. There's just not time. Um, and it also, it messes with the way that, that students see the, the workload in an online course. And we'll talk more about that. Um, and as we were talking about before, we really want to think about how to make these things complementary. How am I going to make sure that the online and the in-person um, fits together and feels comfortable and works well so that um, it doesn't feel uh, like it did with the, with the breakout rooms where you're being yanked from one place to another? Um, so we want to really think about how we're going to do that. We also would ask that you think about using a backward design process. We are going to use this as sort of the basis for the next um, little bit of this uh, the session. But we're not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, this is where if you are interested in learning about um, course design, backward design, you can uh, go look at the uh, Drake Institute um, to uh, take a course design institute there. Are, and there are places at OD that you can also learn more about this. So there are lots of resources for learning about the backward design process. But the overall picture of this is that we start with goals and outcomes. And that gives us a very clear idea of exactly what we want our students to learn. And then from that, we decide how we're going to assess um, those outcomes. How will we know that students have done that? And so we're gonna to talk today about what would that look like in the hybrid course. And then once we know what we want them to do to demonstrate their learning, that allows us to choose content that's well aligned with those assessments. So if we're, if I know I want them to do a particular type of activity, they need something to use to do that activity with. So what content do they need in order to be able to learn those skills? And then lastly, we want to create activities for practicing with that content. Before they finally do that thing that they may be evaluating them on, what activities are they going to do together or with me or separately to practice that content? So those are the pieces that we're going to be going through today. All right, so we're going to start with assessments. So we want you to think about assessments as checkpoints. These are ways for students to provide evidence to you that they have met your course outcomes. And hopefully if you have outcomes that are articulated in a, um, a way with active verbs, for example, like the verb identify um, or define or um, create, um, or evaluate. Those are all active verbs that you can create these, these possible assessments from. We want you to think about providing multiple ways for students to demonstrate these assessments for you. Um, and yet you want it to be a reasonable number of those. And as with many things that we're going to talk about today, there is no perfect um, formula for me to help you or for Stephanie to help you know how many of those things are. But for example, you don't want to be evaluating students daily on their learning because that would be overwhelming for you. That would be overwhelming for them. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to do it once at the middle of the semester and once at the end and say, okay, the rest of your learning in between, I don't really, it doesn't really matter to me where you were. I just care about those points. That's also very stressful for students and probably for you, because if they're off track, you won't know it, but somewhere in between. So what is that going to look like for you? And so that's going to be based on your context and the type of course that you're teaching. Um, as what we mean by these assessments, these could be formative things that just give students feedback on their learning. It could be also summative things like exams, quizzes, projects, all of those things. The important thing about this is with a hybrid course, we, when we come up with an um, assessment is that we want to then think about which bucket is it going to go in? Is it going to go in my in-person bucket or is it going to go in my online bucket? And we have to think about what is going to work better in the, in the different situations. 
So we wanted to give you some examples about what this might look like. These examples are all going to be thinking about what these would look like online. Um, we, we're pretty sure you probably know what these things look like in person. So we want to give you these examples and then you can start thinking about at every point that you want to do an assessment in your course, which would make more sense for in-person or online. Um, this is split up using Bloom's taxonomy um, because that is how we recommend that people write their outcomes. And so when you have a variety of outcomes at different levels of Bloom's, then you can start to create assessments from those. So we've given you an idea from multiple different levels of Bloom's here. So for example, at the very basic level of Bloom's, I just want them to remember something. I want to make sure that they've learned the basic vocabulary or basic concepts it would be really easy to create an online quiz for them to take before their next class, before the next time they're in person with you, for an example. Um, all of these things that we're going to go over are all available through uh, Carmen Canvas. So you could use the, the quiz function in Carmen, for example, to have them take that quiz online before they come in. If we jump down, we could have them analyze something. Maybe they compare a couple of different data sets, and then they post an analysis uh, for peer review with other students. This can be done through the assignment and then the peer review function in Carmen. So you can see as you go down here, there are lots of different options and all of these work well in Carmen. All right, so our next reflection point here for you, um, Thinking about the course, if you've already taught this course that you're thinking about creating a hybrid course from, which assessments are you going to keep from the way that you have taught this course in the past? And which, which things are things I think I might either need to replace with online things or just tweak so they might work online, or maybe I need to create something entirely new um, to fit this new hybrid. And which ones that I have would be best suited for online? So take a moment and think about that. Just write it down somewhere for yourself. Teresa, as they're reflecting, we are doing fantastic with time. <laughs> so um, if there are questions or if I see Laura has something in there that we are, we are fine on time to address some of the things, or if anyone wants to share in the chat, you're welcome to. Or if you have, if I've gone too quickly because I was trying to make sure we were on time and you'd like for me to go back to something, I can do that too. So Laura says that, uh, the challenges this past semester um, that the students didn't do anything asynchronous. Um, and that that is a challenge. Um, and I, I think that I think that's always difficult. I think it's even more difficult right now with um, COVID. So I would I would um, give yourself some grace and give them some grace. And perhaps the things that you are trying now, if you're trying some things that you thought um, should have worked. Um, try it again when we are out of, of this highly stressful period and see if they work better. Um, but typically the things that we encourage people to do is to make sure that the, the that complementary nature, uh, that the asynchronous things are going to build into something that um, that is is that they will have needed to do those things in order to do well at it. I saw somebody, I, I, and this is, I'm hearing this from my daughter's second grade class as well, that the students are skipping the videos and going straight to the assessments. Um, I'm assuming that that didn't work as well for them as that they had hoped. <laughs> So that's one of the things that you can do is point out that I see that this is what's happening. You're skipping the videos, but then you're not doing as well on these assessments that I've built for you. It really will make it easier for you to do better on these and get better grades if you go back and watch what I posted. Um, Amanda has a really good point that I... I yeah, I was just trying to read that. You wanna... <laughs> I'm 
just the expectation and the experience between the in-person and those online components are very different. So thinking really carefully about if, for example, we're having to do discussion posts, if we're in a classroom situation, we're not asking every student to comment on every single discussion comment, right, that each one of us makes. So, you know, one of the, the, the pieces to this entire design process is making things manageable and feasible and just more realistic, right? So really thinking carefully about, you know, do they actually need to post a response, for example, to five different, right, comments? <laughs> Can it be one, right? Can it be that you have to do three over the course of right, three weeks? Are there ways to make it a little bit more flexible and more manageable? Because then you do have to do something with those, those assessments, right? Those discussion posts don't grade themselves. <laughs> right. I had a student tell me this last spring that the thing that worked best for her um, in discussion posts was when they were um, structured more as a reflection and so it was a broader thing rather than a bunch of little things that it was a broader reflection that then they posted for each other and then they were they could talk about it in class. So I thought that was an interesting idea of a kind of a way to, to change um, to change that a little bit. All right, let's see what else we have here. Okay, some issues with multiple choice exams, struggling with that. And um, yeah, I know that there are some resources for um, figuring out how to set up exams and um, making choices between that and open book in Carmen. That's a whole different topic. Yes, hybrid is, hybrid is it, the, yes, it is more work. There's some flexibility, but it's it, but you there's a price to pay for that flexibility. I agree. All right. Is there anything else in there, Stephanie, that you saw that you thought we should go back to? Not necessarily. Okay. While um while you're going on to the next um, part on content, I'll I'll double check for us. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Um, in our, our uh, quick design process here, we said that we have our outcomes already, then we think about um, how we want to assess students. And then once we know what those assessments are, then we need to consider um, what content it is that students need to successfully complete those things. So um, a couple of ideas about how to think about that content. Um, in a hybrid course, we want to think about that there are there are a huge variety of the types of materials that are really more available than they ever have been online for students now, especially now that we've been through um, this COVID epidemic or pandemic. Um, there are lots of different kinds of choices of open resources. There are websites and um, journals, things that they can access easily. So thinking about not restricting yourself just to the textbook that they may have in their hands is uh, a really useful thing to give them a very rich um, set of materials from which to learn. Um, we would also recommend that you think about not trying to do everything through direct instruction, not through all through lecture, um, but that may not be the best way to use that precious. Now you've seen that that um, with this hybrid model, that in-person time when you're face-to-face -face is even more limited than it is in a regular um, in person class. So we want to think about how to use that time wisely. And is that really the best ways to use it with lecture? Or can they be doing that in more of the flipped um, model that Stephanie was talking about earlier? Can they be watching the tutorials or the demos or things online videos beforehand and then working through and really um, doing those problem sets with you in class perhaps? So we want to think about when when they're going to access that content. And again, does it go in the in-person bucket or does it go in the online bucket? All right, so um, another reflection question for you to think about on your own here. Um, and as long as we are still doing okay on time, I'm happy to answer questions that you have about it. Um, so, 
think about what is the variety of, of content that I currently use for my students to learn this material. Um, is it already a large variety of this? Are there ways that I might be able to um, increase that? Um, Am I comfortable with the idea of giving up a little bit some of those lectures? Um, maybe I record them and have them watch them asynchronously, or maybe I give up on feeling like I have to te tell them everything in person. Can they read something? Can they work something out on their own? And that's gonna be different for every person. Um, this is also a, um, a good place to tell you that if you are interested in increasing the variety of materials that you're using, we have an incredible staff of subject librarians that are um, available to you at our library. And um, perhaps Queenie, you could give us a link to the, um, the subject librarians. Um, there are, I don't know how many there are on campus, but there are a ton of them and they are so helpful. I have, I have gone to them repeatedly and it's, um, that's really a useful thing to think about when you're increasing the, the variety of your content. Let's see what's coming in here. We yeah. had a question a little bit earlier about um, our departments are not choosing OER, uh, open source materials. I wonder if we can choose them. Stephanie, do you know the answer to that? I, I don't know what the, what the... I'm not sure if I understand the question. I, um, I know it had to be something that was chosen at the departmental level. It isn't, but, but departments are it depends on what the department is <laughs> and which department we're talking about. Right, so that may be a contextual question. That may be something that we can mm -hmm. answer more specifically later. Yeah. Yeah. In math and stats. I would still probably contact that, that subject librarian directly. Um, there isn't, they are part of, they work closely with OD's ALX group. So that's the, um, affordable learning uh, group. And I am sure they have been working with dozens and dozens of folks. And I'm sure that they can give you a better sense of what, what other folks have done. But I do know, for example, in math, other folks have used um, some um, open text. So. But that does make sense that I know that the math and stat groups are, are things are very locked down that you, that everybody has to do the same thing. So that it, I, I understand now what you mean by department level decisions. Yeah. Um, and yes, Karen, I agree that the recorded lectures are, it's, it is great if you can keep them to 20 minutes or less. Even, even less would be better. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 10 to 15. Um, yeah. Fixed textbooks. Yep. I understand. Um, I would still check with yeah. the ALX folks though. And just, just to verify that they're, they're, there aren't other things on the horizon that other folks have been doing or using to either supplement if it's not changing out the textbook. Um, and I'm sure that we can uh, assure Laura that there are resources available to her even without having to drive to Columbus, correct? She can talk with an instructional designer <laughs> or I know that you can um, work with the Drake Institute um, from a distance. We've gotten really good at this whole Zoom thing where we are happy to help you from a distance. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about the third component. So we've talked about in this design process, we first need to think about assessments. How is it that we're going to measure and have students show us evidence that they have met the learning outcomes or, or not? How do we use content to give them something to actually do, right? So they need content. Um, to play with, right, those assessments and um, to meet the outcomes. And then lastly, this learning activities piece. So we're gonna take a little bit of time to think about you know, what are some of the online and in-person activities that we could use to have students practice, engage with, tinker with, right? How do we get them to, to engage with um, this content in a way that actually helps them practice for those kinds of assessments, right? So rather than, and I don't mean just like do practice exams. I mean, like, how do we get their hands dirty with this content? How do we get them, um, if we say that we want our students to 
be able to evaluate X, Y, and Z. Well, rather than just asking them on the assignment, like evaluate this case, well, how do we give them practice to do that first? And when we're thinking about hybrid classes, you know, the biggest challenge I think for all of us is to think about how do we decide whether that activity needs to happen in the classroom space, that really valuable time that you have them face-to-face -face with you and each other versus putting something online where they're either doing it in groups, big groups, small groups, or individually. And that is not, um, and that's not an easy answer. That again, is not something Teresa and I have like a magic wand to tell you like, these are the ones that only have to the, the, make the most sense only when they're online and vice versa. This is really contextual, right? Based on your own experience. There are a couple of things we wanna think about. If we have a very large activity that we normally do, we wanna think about how do we break those things down into manageable pieces, but we don't wanna make those manageable pieces into just a thousand little pieces of busy work that students see as not connected to each other and they feel like they're constantly having to do something, right? It's, it's a really big change for students. We've been talking about this quite a bit. I've been talking about this quite a bit. You know, this challenge right now in this global situation that we have, when so many of us now have to do either a hybrid class or a high flex course, or we're doing some combination of all of these things, right? We're, we're asking students to do things that they have not really signed up for, right? We're asking students to now do these online components that they just, they may just be used to sitting in most of their classes two to three days a week. They can do that and do their little homework and do some reading. And then once a month, they have some exam, right? That is very different than asking students now engage online to actually do some activities and end up doing something several times, right, a week. That's very different. But we want to make sure that when we take these activities Remember how Teresa said they're complementary, right? They build on each other. So that's what I mean by broken down, that maybe some parts of an activity or um, you know, a particular module, we, we um, a lesson, I should say, so as not to confuse modules and Carmen, but um, some kind of lesson, we break it down into activities that some things are happening, maybe starting online, and then they go into the classroom, and then they maybe follow up online again, right, or vice versa. So how do we break them down in that way? And we really want to think about which things would work best if students had the opportunity to interact and collaborate with each other. And then on the opposite end, which things would make most sense individually. So we just put up a group of um, possible learning activities that probably all of you have done in some shape or form, right? at least most of these. Um, and we just kind of want to talk through with you what are some of the, um, you know, the pros and cons of doing some of these online versus in person. So let's just let's just pick one, right? So what about things like um, debates? That's a good one to, right? You have to pick one side of an argument. Um, and that probably means that they have to do some reading on it. They may have listened to you do some background lecturing, but now they have to um, actually pick a side and present their arguments um, and oppose that right to someone else's. What is the best way to do that? And have any of you done it in an online environment that's worked? just as well as if you did it in person. And while I'm seeing if there is anybody who's done that, um, what are the benefits of doing it in person, right? Maybe you want them to really be engaging synchronously, right? John was writing earlier about what that means by synchronously. And synchronous doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's in person, but maybe you wanna be there in person. You want their students to be able to do it because you wanna be able to give immediate feedback Right? You want them to be building on each other in the moment because maybe that's a skill that you want them to have. You don't want them to do it, for example, in a discussion board online because then there's just too much time in between. Right, um, But maybe that's what you're interested in. Maybe you want students to take time and respond carefully. And right? so you always have to go back to your outcomes. 
What is the skill? What is the thing that you're trying to get students to do? And for some of you, if you want that quick kind of right, feeding off of each other um, in that debate environment and you wanna be able to interject immediately, then probably online may be a little bit difficult, right? Maybe in person is the best time to do that. And they will have read everything first and then they come to class. Maybe, for example, like doing peer reviews. Any of you do peer review in the classroom? We have them actually read each other's stuff and give feedback. For some of you, that's really important to do that in the classroom space because, again, you maybe you want to pause and then you want them to switch right their partners and then you want to talk about what it is that they were reviewing each other's work on. Maybe you want to make sure that you're taking that rubric step by step that you're having your students use to peer review, and you want to just make sure that that's in an environment that is. Um, like live, right? And that you feel like you want to be able to walk around and listen to and watch, right? And engage. So maybe that's for you really important to do that activity in face-to-face -face classrooms. On the other hand, several of you are writing about how, well, doing that kind of peer review, well, Carmen has a peer review tool built in and it works great. And if I provide a rubric for my students, that that is the tool that I want them to use. And then they get to give each other feedback and I can even have them give each other Right in that peer review, um, when you set peer reviews up, you can have them review each other's, or it could be uh, just completely, you know, random. Um, you can have them do more than one peer review, and maybe online works perfectly fine for you. So there is no magic answer to this. For each of these, you kind of have to think about what is really the core here, right? What what about that activity makes it that I really need my valuable class time that I have with them face-to-face, -face, that that's the thing I need to do then. I, I really need that valuable time to be spent on this particular activity. And maybe that brainstorming thing is just a list that I have them do, right, online, asynchronously. They can just add to an Office 365, like a Word Online document, right? And they're just adding to each other. They don't need to do that verbally with me in the classroom. So I just went through a couple of examples thinking about that, and I'd love to hear from you, um, more of you in the, in the chat about which learning activities have you um, done successfully in the online environment? Is there something that you moved successfully that you did in the, in the classroom and you moved it online successfully? Or if you don't have one of those, and if, if instead, if there is one that you wanna share, like, nope, I still, I have this great activity that I do, if you're anything like Teresa and I, we love post-its. Everyone who's worked with me knows I love post-its. And like figuring out how to do a post-it activity <laughs> online is really challenging to me. Like, nope, I will not do a post-it activity online. It's really hard. I want my classroom time to, to, for them to do some kind of graphic organization. Um, a couple of, I, I saw a, a couple of uh, comments ago, someone had mentioned doing um, poster presentations. And maybe that didn't work so well online because the way that it was just hard to see. Maybe that's something you want to do in person. <laughs> see, Queenie knows me already so well. I do love my post-its. So um, some of the things that I've seen come up, Stephanie, are... Um, yeah, I see some great things. Yeah, student presentations of semester um, projects. We had a genetic engineering debate. Um, projects that students used uh, teams to do that worked well. Yeah, we have some role plays group. and world cafe discussions happening, breakout rooms, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. I'm going to talk a little bit about some tools to use. I know you were having a previous conversation about that. We do. I do want to briefly go over some of the um, tools that you can use. And um, one of them are virtual whiteboards I saw someone talk about that. Good. So we've got lots of examples here. And maybe this is a good time to um, remind everyone, if you haven't seen it from Queenie in, in, yet in the chat, that if you find the three little dots down at the bottom of your chat, there's a little box with three dots. If you click on that, then you can save the chat. And that way you have all of these ideas and links. And we'll remind you as we move along. So I just want to take a moment for you to think about, again, for uh, just for yourself and to give us some processing time, which activities are best done when you are physically present with your students? And is there an activity or more that are best done or could be done just as well with me not physically there? So thinking ahead.
Okay, I'm going to invite you to put into the chat any questions that we haven't gotten to so far. Um, <clears throat> so let's um, make sure that uh, that you know that if you put them in there, we'll get we'll get to them. I'm going to talk a little bit here in a moment about um, pulling things together, but I know there. Um, while I'm doing that, Teresa or um, John or Sam or any of our other folks could probably help answer that question. Okay, so let's talk about pulling things together. So we talked about this design process and these three major things, the assessments, the content, and the activities. So what is a way to actually start mapping this stuff out? Because as has been mentioned by several of you, you know, creating hybrid classes is not easy. There's a lot of pieces that you have to juggle. So this isn't necessarily a grid that you would give your students, um, but it is a way for you to map out, like what are my outcomes for this particular week? What's my content going to be that I want to provide online? What's the thing I want to actually present or facilitate or discuss, right? What's the content in person? What are those learning activities, both online and in person, and then those assessments? And I just wanted to give you an example of one that is partially completed. So uh, it's really important in hybrid classes as in online courses or anything that's like not your student's typical kind of way of engaging in a course. It's really important in week one to take some of that time to make sure they understand how this is all going to work. And so getting them engaged in the, the online and the in-person piece is going to be incredibly important. So you have to map that out. So here's an example of in week one, this particular person wants their students to be able to navigate through Carmen. I need to make sure they understand where all the pieces are. And I want them to be able to meet each other. And I want them to be able to use the quiz tool pretty quickly because we're going to use that for surveying and polling and for quizzing later on. So I know in order to make those things happen, uh, maybe I'll go all the way to the right, right? So in my assessments, I think I want to have, a. Uh, this person says, I think I want to have a syllabus quiz prior to class. Uh, maybe just graded for completion, not like graded for a grade, but that will help me see if they've actually read, kind of force them to read through the syllabus. Um, and maybe I want to do something in person, maybe some kind of pre-survey to find out like what are their goals as a learner in this course. Again, those are formative, right? Ungraded, not something that gets a grade. And the content, I definitely want to do a demo of Carmen. I have a reading that I want them to do about the content itself for this particular course. And I think in class, it will be really important for me to introduce the course goals and really go over the major themes of, the, of this course. And my activities, I want to have them do a tutorial. Maybe they could watch a tutorial of Carmen and the different components and how they everything feeds together in this course. And then in person, I'll use that time to do some kind of icebreaker or maybe some large group discussion of the first reading. So I've got it all mapped out, right? All my different components for that first week. And you see there's a little bit of both content and how to get my students engaged in this, understanding how this course works. And then week two is something similar, but it's around a particular content, right? I want them to differentiate between an opinion and scientific consensus. So if I go to my assessments, I think maybe doing some kind of quiz, maybe there's some kind of small group activity. I want them to do a reading online, but I also want them to answer questions about the reading and have, you know, I may bring up some extra examples in class right? and I'll have them do a small online activity where they read an example and post a response. And then in person, I'll actually have them discuss about those examples and make some final determinations. Just as you can hopefully see how these things are fitting together. So I'm gonna map it out that way. Now, when I'm also planning, I'm going to add more columns to this, and it's going to be about what are the tools, right, online. So all the pieces that are online, particularly those activity parts, what are the tools that I want to use? And we've already given you some examples of Carmen, because that's the simplest thing to use, the thing you have the most support with, the thing your students are most familiar with, and probably you are most familiar with. But there are other OSU tools that I just want to make sure that you have. Um, when you download these slides, you'll be able to click on each of these links and they'll take you to the main page for each of them. So if any of you are doing any of that kind of blogging or you're wanting them to create a wiki together where they're creating a website you know, as a, as a group um, internally at first, the u.osu.edu tool works really well. I've used it for my own classes. Um, maybe you want to um, use our top hat system for some polling and surveys. And then Microsoft has a lot of tools and we're 
moving more and more towards using more of the Office 365 tool set as we move things over into using Teams more. Um, some of you will be using OneDrive more. Some of you have already been using the OneNote system. Um, Yammer is also supported by Ohio State. All of these things are supported by Ohio State, which means if there is an issue that you have, you can contact the IT folks and say, I am not making X, Y, and Z work well, and so can your students. That does not mean you have to use OSU supported tools all the time. You can use non-university supported tools, and these are just a very few, and I've seen a couple others pop up in the chat, and I love to use this as a time for us to kind of crowdsource other tools that you've used. Um, so if you have others that you haven't added to the chat, please do. Um, these are ones that I know people have been using. I've done quite a number of workshops. Sam has done them with me um, over the years on other tools that are not necessarily um, stamped with approval by the university. So if you have a problem with Kahoot not working, you can't contact right, the university's IT support. But we do know that people are using it. Um, and it's a nice little system, right? It's fairly simple. My kids use it all the time in their classes. Um, I know some people at the university are using Slack. You may decide that you wanna use Microsoft Teams because it is a supported tool and you could figure out how to use Teams to do the kinds of things that you want. Um, maybe some of you have been using H5P. It's come up in a number of workshops we've done. It is again, not necessarily a supported university tool. Um, so people can't hear like in OD, we can't help you create things using it and we can't help if it's broken. Okay, that's a really important piece. It does not mean that you're banned from using it though. Okay, you just have to recognize um, that any challenges you have, you'll have to kind of figure out through their own helplines, right? You'll have to contact the H5P folks. I, is this you, Teresa, who keeps mentioning Miro, your favorite? <laughs> yeah, I didn't bring it up. I just <laughs> wanted, it because Pamela said that she really liked it. Or she wanted to know if anybody else had used it. And I said that. Got I, it. I don't know the answer to Amanda's, Amanda's question. I don't know if Sam or Queenie does, um, but I'll look it up here after I'm, if they don't, I will uh, look it up here in a moment. I want to get you back into small groups for a really short amount of time here for you to kind of process together. I'm going to start these groups afresh um, and not have you guys zapping through space like I did. My apologies. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to do this for a few minutes for you to share, you know, is there one kind of piece of content or an activity that you feel like you really do want to keep online? Um, and what's something that you want to move maybe online if you were to teach a hybrid course in the future? All right. So lastly, I want us to talk a little bit about how to communicate those expectations. If you remember in the beginning, one of the challenges that and considerations that Teresa mentioned was communicating those expectations and making sure we're all on the same page with our students. So how do we do that communication to prepare students for success in our course? Um, there are a few ways to do that. One is to create, create a consistent module organization in Carmen, and I'll show you an example. Um, we want to obviously always provide clear instructions for assessments and activities, but particularly because in a hybrid course, you know, they need to understand very clearly what's the thing that's happening online and what's the thing that I need to prepare for for in class. So I'll also share an example of that. Another important piece of that communication is not just what text we're writing, but also how do we make sure that we have some social presence. It's very easy to do that in the in-person class, right, because we're there and we're going to remind them right? This is um, what's coming up. Here's how the pieces fit together. Thank you so much for your, you know, your hard work on the assignments, right? Those are kind of things we naturally do in, um, in the in-class environment. And if you're not as comfortable with the online part, we need to make sure we're doing the same thing in the online part. What kind of videos can we put together? What kind of announcements can we be writing to help them understand the flow of the course? Um, and just communicating with students as you know, making sure that they see you and you know they know that you see them. One thing I do wanna mention is there is a syllabus template that will help you with some wording for lots of things, but three in particular, the technology requirements. So what do you have to write on your syllabus if you are using some of those other tools, whether or not they're supported by the university or not? What are the um, academic integrity things that we probably all should, should say? What are the uh, 
um, you know, lots of things opening up here on my computer. Discussion guidelines, right? So there are some examples on that syllabus template that I think would be really useful for you. And then I want to just briefly, very briefly share with you, you have these slides. Um, Queenie will probably share them one last time before you leave, but there are three examples I wanted to show you. The first is like, what would it look like for a syllabus statement? What could you write that would help your students understand what those expectations are? And this is an example of what someone wrote for a three credit hour course. This first paragraph here talks about, let's see if I can do a laser pointer, right? This first one up here talks about the hybrid format. So that's what it means for this particular class. Right, these are um, the ways that we're going to engage um, and how we're going to engage. And in particular, the in-class requirements. So here's when we're going to be meeting. This is how long it's going to be. This is mandatory. This is like, not just like extra, like <laughs> the in-class, in-person part is required. Um, here's what we're going to be doing. And then here's an example of like, here's the online requirements. So. What's important in this one for me is spelling out this three credit hours. I think we should be doing this for all of our classes, regardless of what modality we teach in. But I think particularly for online and modality class um, and hybrid modalities, it's really important to kind of spell out, like remember that a three credit hour course does not mean you work three hours a week. <laughs> the expectation is that there's probably more like nine hours a week and maybe even more, right? Maybe there's 12 hours a week if you really want to get a good grade in this class. Regardless, I think about how you're going to talk about like how much time this takes, right? So what is the expectation for those online courses? How much work will be there? This is an example of what you may want to put in your syllabus schedule. Remember that schedule that we all kind of have? It's on a nice little table in a printed uh, syllabus and it has like week one and it just has like, you know, what the readings are and then when exams are. That will not work for a hybrid course. You need to spell out which things are happening in person, which things are happening pre-class, which things are happening online, post-class. Here's an example of one that's um, on a topic in week eight on um, ethics and social work. And that first one is, right, these are the things you need to do. See how it's spelled out right here? Very clearly, big, bold letters, and capital letters, right? Read this thing, watch this thing, do this thing. Right? In face-to-face -face classes, bring this thing with you. These are the activities we'll do. And then as a follow-up to that in-person class, you'll read something online, you'll do the assignment, you'll read something else, and you'll do this other assignment. Right? So that's an example of how really spelled out you need to be. And then lastly, here's an example of what your module could look like. And this is kind of a typical, like, there's lots of different versions, but a typical kind of structure that you'd want to use consistently. Remember, we had that consistent module structure, right? So here's the thing that's happening online, right? And it's gonna take this long. Here are the readings that you have to do. And then in person, right? Here's the agenda for what we're gonna do in person. This is just one example. I actually have another really good one that was just shared with me yesterday that I can email out if you're interested. Um, and I think, there are lots of ways to do it, um, but I think the most important piece here is that it's consistent and students always understand this is the online stuff, this is the face-to-face -face stuff. So we're not gonna have you do this uh, and take a moment right now, but it is in your worksheet that we gave you a copy of and we just want you to kind of, in your own time, wrap up this communication piece with, think, with by thinking about what do you need to adjust with your own syllabus to better communicate your expectations. And where we'd like to end before we just briefly talk about um, resources is for you to share with us if you're interested in the chat, what is the most important takeaway from today's session? We threw a lot at you. So if you could pick one thing, what's kind of the most important takeaway that you have for any future classes that you teach in the hybrid structure? Yeah, replace, don't add. I was glad someone, so replace, don't add is one of my, is one of my key points um, that I have. So while you're writing down in the chat, I'd love to see what other takeaways you have. These are kind of my takeaways. Um, you know, design early this process, as you mentioned, this is not easy. Design strategically and maybe incrementally. I really think it's important, as Teresa said early on, to give yourself grace about lots of things, right? Don't try and create the most amazing, perfect hybrid course the first time out. Create something that's going to work 
and that is designed pretty well, but is not going to make you have to do somersaults backward and forwards of trying to figure all of this out. You don't have to do all of the technology, right? Keep that technology simple at first. Maybe just use the pieces in Carmen that you know and your students know, and then you can add other pieces in later and get fancier, right? Replacing, not adding, right? Replace course components, don't just add more stuff because that's gonna make you miserable and it'll make your <laughs> students miserable. That's not what we need right now. So we wanna make sure that we're not adding more things to create more busy work and everything is done very strategically and pur um, purposefully. And then lastly, of course, ask for assistance and there's lots of places to go. We are happy, Queenie and myself are two of the members of our consulting team who would be happy to help you think through what are the tools that you could use, um, ideas on how to make this hybrid course work. If you are interested in like bigger course design issues, of course the Drake Institute would be a great place to go. And I do um, wanna make sure that I point out that this particular session is one of many, almost all of our sessions, if not all of them, uh, feed into a teaching endorsement that is run out of the Drake Institute. And this one in particular is good for the, um, the technology enhanced teaching. So if you're interested in a teaching endorsement, that will get you the link there. So I'm gonna stay um, on, so we'll Teresa and Queenie just for a little bit after this. Um, and Queenie, if you have to go, that's okay. But Teresa and I will stick around for a little bit if you have additional questions that we haven't got to. Um, and if you need to go, we totally understand. And thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your participation today and sharing your stories and your, your experiences.